Welcome to Brain Ponderings Podcast. I'm the host, Mark Matson. Uh, today, my guest is Charles Nemiroff. He's a professor and Matthew P. Nemiroff Endowed Chair in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Texas Austin Medical School. Uh, there, he's also the director of the Institute for Early Life Adversity Research, and I guess, as is common now across the country, a fairly new center for psychedelic research and therapy. He's a, a world's expert on depression and anxiety disorders, both basic understanding of what's going on in the brain, what are the risk factors, genetic or environmental, and also in, uh, in treatment. And so he sees patients. And uh, welcome, Dr. Nemiroff. Mark, so great to be with you. It's good to connect with you after all these years. Yeah, <laughs> it's been a long time. You used to be at, well, let's start from the beginning. You were you're from New York City, is that right? I'm from New York City, and I um, went to medical school and earned my PhD degree at the University of North Carolina. I did a couple years of residency there and then at Duke, and then I moved to Emory University in 1991, served as chair there for 18 years, then nine years at Miami, uh, at the University of Miami, and then six years ago, I was seduced away to this new medical school here at the University of Texas in Austin. Yeah, the the University of Texas uh, university program, they have multiple medical centers, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, and then in Austin. They've been recruiting a lot of people. I I had a colleague of mine that I collaborated with, and he just got recruited down to UT Houston to start a new program in like neuroinflammation, focusing on microglia and whatever various disorders. Um, and so your early research, Charlie, was on neuropeptides. Is that right? It was basic yeah. research. Um, what? Why don't you just kind of briefly describe? Everybody listening to this kind of has an idea what neurotransmitters are, which are derived from amino acids most of them. What are neuropeptides and why are they important just generally? So um, <clears throat> there are a large number of neuropeptides and neuropeptides are compounds of various sizes that are chains of amino acids. And they serve as um, uh, neurotransmitters in the brain. There are more than 50 of them. Many people have heard of the opiate-like neuropeptides like endorphins and enkephalins, but there are a class of neuropeptides that regulate the endocrine system. So corticotropin releasing hormone, thyrotropin releasing hormone that act at the pituitary to control the release of pituitary hormones that in turn control the release of peripheral hormones like um, uh, estrogen, progesterone, thyroid hormone, uh, cortisol, um, and then there are other neuropeptides like substance P, galanin, um, that are neurotransmitters in their own right. And they're very ubiquitously distributed across different brain regions where they subserve different functions. Some of them um, have been targeted, their receptors, in terms of new drug development, uh, both in areas like pain, but also in psychiatric disorders. And these neuropeptides, so neurons can uh, produce both a classic neurotransmitter like glutamate, GABA, acetylcholine, dopamine, serotonin, and a neuropeptide. And it, it used to be that the these peptides were thought to kind of just modulate very subtly the synapses that are being activated or inhibited by the classic transmitters, right? Um, and is that where you got interested in stress then because and the links of chronic uncontrollable stress, kind of psychosocial stress to clinical disorders like anxiety disorders and depression? So um, <clears throat> um, as I was uh, way back when in the um, uh, early 1980s, I was a young investigator and there were a series of reports that came out that suggested that depressed patients um, 
had abnormalities in the major mammalian stress system, namely the pituitary adrenal axis. And there were reports of cortisol hypersecretion in patients with depression, particularly those with more severe depression and suicidality. And so I had the fortunate um, uh, happenstance of becoming close friends with Wiley Vale, yeah. who was an investigator at the Salk Institute and turned out to be uh, the scientist who discovered um, the nature of corticotropin releasing factor, the chemical sequence. This is sort of the brain's orchestra leader of the stress response, and it controlled the um, endocrine response to stress by virtue of its, of its action on ACTH and then, of course, cortisol, but also the behavioral, immune, uh, and autonomic uh, uh, effects of stress. And so because we were good mm -hmm. friends and fly fishing buddies and traveled all over the world together, wow. uh, Wiley was willing to provide me with the antibody to CRH, and I was able to do a number of studies to suggest that it was involved in stress-related psychiatric disorders. Unfortunately, he passed away uh, several years ago unexpectedly, uh, suddenly of a heart attack, uh, and we 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 miss him greatly. But uh, you know, you have to take advantage of serendipity in your career. Yeah. Have you ever tried Tenkara? Fly no, fishing. Oh, oh, Tenkara. No, I haven't. It's it's I I I one time in Ireland, um, I was with the late Brian Leonard who's a neuropharmacologist, and he took me out outside of Galway to a uh, uh, to go fishing on this lake. And uh, they, they used a technique called dapping, which I had never heard of, which is really a form of tenkara. Uh, so th there's no reel. Right. There's just a pole and a line, and yep. you're just um, um, keeping the fly by the surface yeah, hoping a fish will come and get it. So, yeah, I, I've, I've been doing that the last couple of years since I retired really? from the NIH, and it's it's really easy. It's we've just got these you know foldable rods. No, as you said, no reel, and then just like two lines, one that floats on the water, and then at the end that uh, another one that's tied to the line. It actually works really well. It's that's it's cool. Amazing. And it's easy. You can cast, you can use it like a slingshot because the, there's these carbon fiber rods and they bend. So if you have a lot of trees overhead, you don't have to cast like this. You just go sideways and pull it back and flip it. Yeah. But anyway, so we're getting, we're getting off topic a little bit. <laughs> um, okay, so then what, what do we know uh, so far about the neurochemical alterations in the brain and depression. So there's been a lot of controversy about this, Mark, as you know, in recent years. And there was a report uh, that was published in the British literature by a, a couple of psychologists who suggested that the entire idea of serotonin being involved in the uh, pathophysiology of depression was, was way off base. And... Um, we're very critical of the database. Mm -hmm. And I would take strong issue with that. Yeah. I think there's pretty good data that serotonin is involved in some patients in terms of pathophysiology. The problem with studying depression is that it's an amazingly heterogeneous um, um, entity. And if you look at the diagnostic criteria for depression, um, in addition to being depressed, feeling sad, blue, down in the dumps for a couple of weeks every day, you have to fulfill five of nine other symptoms. And um, we now know that, that if you look at the combination of those symptoms, there are several thousand potential combinations that would lead to a diagnosis of major depression. So you could overeat or undereat. You could sleep too much or sleep too little. You can have feel better in the morning and worse as the day goes on, or you could feel 
worse in the morning and better as the day go on. And so we know that there's a lot of heterogeneity and studying depression is a little like studying hypertension. There are lots of causes of hypertension that we now understand. So you could have renal hypertension, you could have a pheochromocytoma. We would never link or lump all of those into one category and say hypertension, right? Right, Because you would never figure out what the underlying causes are. And so um, we always have this problem in, in both in clinical trials for depression, but also in looking at pathophysiology, the balance between a more homogeneous sample um, for example, and there I'll give you you know many examples of this, but a more homogeneous ex- sample in which then you are less likely to be able to generalize, yeah, versus an extremely heterogeneous sample. And you know, just to give you a couple of examples, um, we know that patients with a history of child abuse and neglect have a much poorer response to antidepressants and to evidence-based psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. And that's probably because they're biologically different. And we could talk about that later if you want. But if you lump them all together in a depression sample, um, you're gonna end up with with varied results. You know, women are different than men. And so part of the problem here has to do with the regulatory authorities. So um, the FDA approves treatments for major depression. And so if you limit your sample, let's say you decide to limit your sample to patients who are treatment refractory, who have failed three or four other treatments, then then the label that the FDA will give you is is for that. Uh And many companies feel that now it's too restrictive in terms of the population. So, you know, it's sort of a trade-off, but yeah. the heterogeneity is a problem. That's also, I, I think, a, a big problem in translation of animal studies to humans in that the animal studies are not a very heterogeneous population. And so the the standard deviation between individual animals when you're in the control or the treatment group is small, so one can pick out small but significant differences. But then when you go to humans, we're genetically heterogeneous. We've had, we've grown up in different environments, different exposures, you know, early life experiences, et cetera, um, different levels of, and we can talk about when we get to risk reduction, talk about things like exercise, uh, you know, healthy diet, not overeating, uh, those kinds of things, which seem to be good for reducing risk for a lot of disorders, including, I think, depression and anxiety disorders. But again, you know, so so we got these humans with, everybody's got different background, different genetics, and so you, there may be an effect, but you can't pick it up because of the, the scatter. But let me let me say something about animal models because I obviously spent a lot of time in my early years working in animal models. And recently my colleagues and I here published a paper in Neuron where we were extremely um, skeptical about animal models of post-traumatic stress disorder. And what I tell my colleagues um, is that uh, there are good animal models of certain psychiatric disorders, particularly addiction, yeah, and certain anxiety disorders, like generalized anxiety disorder, but depression is a very unique human condition. And like, think about it. Let's start with the fact that there has never been a reported case of suicide in a non-human species. Yeah, right. And so, I... think about it. We had fif- over fifty thousand suicides in the United States last year, and a million attempts, million. And we're trying to model a disease 
of which suicide is the worst possible outcome. And, a, you know, no animal model of depression in any, um, in any species has ever resulted in self-harm by, by a rodent, yeah. by yeah. a non-human primate. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. I mean, we do have, you know, we have a lot of cortex. <laughs> Well, and and you know the and one obvious thing is the animals presumably we we don't know for sure, but they don't have any notion of their mortality, you know that that they're going to die, um, which I think that also figures into the psychology of a little bit of suicide. Agree. Yeah. And so the diagnosis is is mainly clinical uh based on you know the psychological tests and so on and and what about neuroimaging is there any benefit of that at all and what about biomarkers are there is there anything that's well so you know we have a lot of leads um and i think the polygenic risk scores for depression have gotten better and better and so um i think you know we and we could talk about artificial intelligence and where this is going to fit wow. into the equation moving forward. Um, but what we've learned is that the candidate gene approach, which I was very invested in, um, which segued into GWAS studies, fundamentally showed that there are, there's not a single gene right. that's the depression gene or the bipolar gene or the schizophrenia gene, but that if you do large studies, GWAS studies that you end up with a number of, of gene variants that are associated with the disorder. Mm -hmm. um, but the conundrum, which I'm sure you know, but for the readers or the listeners to understand, is that disorders like bipolar disorder, two-thirds of the risk to develop it is genetic. For depression, it's 35 to 40 percent. Yet the the GWAS studies have, you know, at the most um, um, can contribute a small percent to risk. So you could look at polygenic risk scores for depression or PTSD. And I think you could say with a reasonable degree of certainty that if you as an individual are in the top 1% of the polygenic risk score, that you have a very reasonable likelihood of developing that disease. But 1% is 1%. Right. What if you're in the top 5% or 8% or 10%? Well, maybe you have a statistically significant effect, but it's probably clinically plus minus. And so, you know, the, the, the reason why GWAS studies are statistically significant is because you're studying a few hundred thousand people and you have a lot of power statistically. Yeah. But the odds ratios for each of the gene variants are minuscule. Yeah. 1.08. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if you have a P minus 10 to the minus 32, that gene is not going to predict your risk. So, you know, getting back to the, the biomarker issue, there are a number of potential biomarkers, inflammatory biomarkers. Some percentage of depressed patients do show elevations in pro-inflammatory cytokines like tumor necrosis factor, uh, interleukin-6, even C-reactive protein. Um, and again, it's going to account for some modicum of risk for developing the disease. So if you look at suicide uh, as an example, um, there's a relationship between inflammation and suicide, both in cerebral spinal fluid and in plasma, but it's not diagnostic. So I, I'm very attracted to an, an AI approach. Um, and I think if we talk about suicide as a exemplar of the, the worst outcome for depression, right? Um, and you think about we know so many risk factors for suicide, right? Being a man instead of a woman, yeah. um, drug and alcohol use, yeah. 
family history of suicide. And then we could add, you know, a PRS score for suicide or for major depression, um, child maltreatment, more recent life stressors. Like an example, if you're diagnosed with cancer, your risk of suicide goes up fourfold in the first six months, regardless of what your prognosis is. So the point I'm trying to make is there are probably 25 or 30 or 40 of these factors that we're aware of that increase risk for, for depression and probably suicide. But of course, um, easy access to firearms is also a factor. No question about it, yeah. because more than half of the of the um, suicides in the United States involve firearms, yeah. more than half. Mm -hmm. um, and we also know that interventions like finally putting barriers on the Golden Gate Bridge actually has resulted in a reduction in suicide. Oh, interesting. Yeah. In California. Yeah. They... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, for years there was a debate that it was going to be, um, it was going to mar the beauty of the bridge, and so it's only recently that those barriers have been put in place. So if you jump now, you end up in a net. <laughs> so, but my point is, but using artificial intelligence, um, I believe in a large enough population we should be able to develop a machine learning model that takes all of these measures into consideration to give us, a, give us an idea of risk, which means that we could begin to practice preventative psychiatry. Like if you knew your child was at risk for depression or suicide or another psychiatric disorder, um, you would be able to um, be very hyper alert yeah. to any potential signs or symptoms. And if our treatments were good enough, we'd want to treat these people before they ever got depressed. Yeah. Yeah. And so risk factors, you know, I, I've actually, Charlie, had a couple bouts of major depression and both of them. Uh, what happened was I had some accident or had to have some surgeries and I I was an avid runner, trail runner, mountain biker, and which was for me, it was like anti-anxiety, anti-depressant. I think it's very clear it is. And then, but when I got injured and couldn't exercise for a month, or in, in one case, several months after I had to have three surgeries after a mountain bike accident, I got depressed. Right. And so I'm wondering what the contribution, my understanding is in the last, I don't know how many years, uh, there's been an increase in the number of people developing de or diagnosed anyway, depression, anxiety disorder, particularly among our younger people and adolescents. And is there a contribution of these kids now getting less exercise, uh, less sleep, uh, maybe even overeating. There's an increased in, uh, incidence of childhood obesity now, and and so they're they're and we, and we can talk about social media, and I'm sure you have a lot to say about that. But are there just general things? Is, is there some way to? It, it seems to me this is the, where that effort should be devoted up front, and getting these kids in healthy not only physical health, but mental health lifestyles as early on as possible. Yeah, so um, thank you for bringing that up. So uh, COVID was a killer in more than one way. And the experiment that with the natural experiment that we ran with COVID was we fundamentally took children and we took two years away from their life. Yeah. And so they lost all their social they didn't go to school. We saw a tremendous increase in childhood maltreatment because there was a large increase in alcohol use in adulthood. That combination of alcohol abuse, 
in in families that were stuck in small apartments where their children weren't able to go to school resulted in the children um, having a higher rate of, of domestic violence, um, being unable to connect with their peers. They became even more dependent on social media. Yeah. Um, they weren't able to exercise. You know, when you and I were kids, you know, I'd get home at three o'clock, I'd throw my books down and I'd go down and play ball. Right. And that's what I, I did. I, until I grew I up home. on a, I grew up on a farm. So I oh. went home and we had uh, harness horses, trotters and pacers. These are bits from a couple of our best horses. This is in the 1970s, early, late 60s, early 70s. Right. So we were. We were we weren't in the house hardly at all except to eat. Right. Yeah. 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 No. Well, for one thing, you know, some of us wanted to get away from the house. So uh <laughs> but yeah, I was brought up in New York City and we would play uh stickball and baseball and little league and touch football and um and we were literally active all the time. And you know, there were three there were about three television stations. When we first got a TV, yeah. maybe yeah. it went to five or six, but also television time was monitored. Yeah, it wasn't like it was on all the time, um, and so we had a lot of physical activity, and you know, Boy Scouts and and being involved in 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 going to Boy Scout camp and and you know where you were hiking and doing all sorts of stuff, right? So. Um, Kids today, not only um, is there less physical activity, uh, but you know I'm the uh, fortunate enough to be the chair of the Texas um, uh, Child uh, Trauma Research Network, and we've been collecting uh, children in the immediate aftermath of trauma from all 12 medical schools across the state. So we've collected about 2,500 children ages eight to 20. Um, and one of the um, major forms of trauma is cyberbullying. Uh, yeah. And so not only is social media a problem because what you could find on it, but on top of that, um, children are targeted by their peers. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, you want to talk about childhood maltreatment. Right. So these things contribute uh, to psychopathology because our diseases, all of them are examples of gene environment interactions. Mm -hmm. So if you have a genetic diathesis for lung cancer, but you never smoke, the chance of you developing it is is there, but it's it's greatly accelerated if you smoke cigarettes. You can have the genetic propensity for depression or PTSD, um, but if you're exposed to childhood trauma or cyberbullying, um, then the chance of you developing the disease is greatly increased. Yeah. And then the other thing I'd mention, Mark, is the incredible widespread availability of cannabis. And you know, I have to tell you, I they, you know, we have a program where we see uh, patients, very complex patients, patients who um, have failed other treatments, and one of the overwhelming presentations, extremely common, is someone in their late twenties, early thirties, been depressed, um, sort of dropped out of their cohort, not going to school anymore, um, been depressed, maybe using substances. But the common denominator is they use cannabis every day. Yeah, well, they're, day. They're, they're substituting that for for kind of more, nat, you know, social interactions or working out a problem or that thing. It's, it's just, it's easier to smoke a joint, I guess, than have to put some effort into moving, yeah. Yeah. Now, so I... My wife's downstairs with her granddaughter. She's a, a granddaughter. This granddaughter, she's a little over a year old. Oh, and and so the congratulations. 
so the, thanks. But the natural the natural state of these kids is to be moving all the time, being very curious about their environment, uh, and being happy. You know, and uh, modern society. What, do you know if there's any data on suicide incidents in, say, hunter gatherer societies, or you know, kind of not because I'm just wondering, you know, if 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 the people in their natural environments are moving around every day, they all know know each other. They're in groups of like a hundred or so, and do you know if there's any data on that? Yeah, I, you're touching on a, a very um, a puzzling question that's never been resolved, which is um, if there's a genetic component to suicide, what's the evolutionary advantage to it that gene remaining in the population? Yeah. And the answer I've always been given, which I find somewhat unsatisfactory, is that, um, that most suicides occur... Um, late in the um, reproductive life of humans, right? So that the gene, you've already reproduced. Yeah. However, the, right now, it used to be when, when you and I were young that the biggest suicide risk was in the 75 to 84-year-olds. Not anymore. Now it's the 25 to 34 age group. And they're certainly in their reproductive prime. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know about the data, but I'll just give you a couple of demographics that you'll, I think, find interesting. In almost every population in the world, men uh, uh, have higher suicide rates than women, except in China. Oh, interesting. Um, and there, there are on average about 200,000 suicides in China every year. Majority are women, and the preferred method of suicide is pesticide overdose. And, and the Chinese have done a good job of actually removing pesticides. But the sort of classic case would be 16-year-old girl is humiliated at school, living on a farm, comes home, goes to the barn, and overdoses on pesticides. Hmm. I don't know about the data about hunter-gatherers. It's confounded by a sort of brutal fact, which is in many so-called primitive civilizations, uh, individuals with psychiatric illness were fundamentally shunned yeah. from the group. Yeah, and, true. you know, I recently read of a um, a report from the 1960s of a, a tribe in Uganda who would take people who were psychotic and fundamentally tie them to a tree and leave them to starve. So I, I don't know that we have any okay. data uh, to bear on your question. All right. Um, do you want to you want to talk a little bit about uh, resilience? Yeah, I, absolutely. I I, I want to be I I want to be circumspect about my time. Yeah, I have another meeting in twenty minutes. So that's fine. Um, so um, yeah, resilience. So hard thing to study because it's the the definition of resilience is the absence of a pathology in the face of adversity. So what's really interesting about resilience is if you look at the literature related to profound trauma, either acute or chronic, so either the Holocaust or um, Oklahoma City or 9-11, not everybody um, is exposed to this horrific trauma develops any psychopathology. Right. So there's a a level of resilience that that certain individuals have. That's not to say they don't get sad or they don't get angry, but they don't develop sort of syndromal depression or anxiety. Mm -hmm. And and so um, I think it a little bit about myself in that I've been through lots of stuff in life. 
uh, but I don't worry. It's just, I don't have that gene. Yeah. I can get sad about things, but, um, and everybody else is sort of like, you know, the sky's falling in and it, I just don't have that. Uh, I, you're, you're fortunate. I think I do have it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I just, you know, I just only try to deal with things I can control. Yeah, that's, that's good. So, um, so I think there, there, there were some initial studies that try to determine how do you study the biology of resilience, which is a hard thing to study because it's the absence of pathology. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's easy, relatively easy to get people with depression to volunteer for studies, but to get people who don't have depression, right? right? <laughs> um, it's a little harder. There was a lot of, of hoopla some years ago about maybe substance P being involved in the biology of resilience. Hmm. Uh, it was also a lot about NPY, another yeah. neuropeptide. Yeah. yeah. But there, there really has not, um, um, hasn't borne any fruit. Are there, are there twin studies? I, I don't know. You'd have to have like identical twins that were exposed to the same trauma. And then one of them, you know, didn't end up developing depression or whatever. That's yeah, so there, there was one study, not quite answering that question, but there was a study done in Vietnam veterans who were identical twins, trying to begin to look at that. Hmm. Um, and it turned out that the major finding of the study was that, um, number one, they didn't have identical early upbringings. Okay, and it turned out that some of the some of the twins, one of the twins was exposed to early life trauma, and the other wasn't. I see. And in that study, what they showed was, given equal combat exposure, the twin with the early life maltreatment history, um, those were the twins that developed PTSD, mm -hmm. whereas the twin that didn't have the early life um, um uh, adversity did not yeah so we come back to that same thing of the early life environment and its impact on mental health going forward well you know mark the, the human brain doesn't mature until age 24 yeah and so <clears throat> we know that a growing brain is vulnerable to insult we know that from fetal alcohol syndrome we know that from lead toxicity and i think we now know it from behavioral what i call behavioral toxicity yeah. and <clears throat> we and others have reported brain imaging findings um as a result of um childhood maltreatment that persist for the for the lifetime of the individual yeah okay uh so what about Current treatments, I, most people listening, I mean, depression is so common that it's it's highly unlikely that a viewer or listener to our conversation has an either themselves had a bout or two of depression or had a friend or a relative. Um, and so, you know, they know about what's generally prescribed, the, the drugs that keep more serotonin and or norepinephrine in the synapse and therefore get kind of a longer, more activation of those receptors. Um, but our, so besides this, uh, suggesting to a patient, or, you know, you, you, you talk to him and do you get exercise? You know, what's your diet? Is there any effort to actually get these patients changing their lifestyle? Yeah, so l let's start with the fact that <clears throat> um, accessibility to good treatment is a problem in the United States, um, um, partly because of issues related to third-party payers um, and also related to the availability of, of adequately trained clinicians. And, and therapists. And there are a lot of obstacles. Yeah, yeah. So 
in a world of infinite bounty, yeah. which few of us live in, um, there's what I do is I sit down with patients and I provide them with a menu of evidence-based treatments. So this is what we know, but what we don't know is I can't tell you what the best treatment is for you, right? We have no predictors of treatment response. I have a paper coming out in the American Journal of Psychiatry showing that all the pharmacogenomic testing uh, uh, that's available is bogus. Uh, and it really isn't worth the damn in terms of predicting antidepressant response. Hmm. It's a waste of money. So I'll explain to patients, as you described, they're the SSRIs. Yeah. Um, and, and they're not all the same. And some have more side effects than others. And I'll describe the side effects. The SNRIs, as you mentioned, that affect norepinephrine and serotonin. The unusual antidepressants like bupropion, um, mirtazapine, and others. The older antidepressants, the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, the tricyclic antidepressants. I'll talk to them about evidence-based psychotherapy, yeah. um, including cognitive behavior therapy, uh, for depression, but for PTSD, other forms of therapy, all evidence-based. I'll talk to them about neuromodulation. I'll explain to them about transcranial magnetic stimulation. That's FDA approved. I'll talk to them about electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, still the most effective treatment, but not without its side effects. Uh, vagal nerve stimulation is another That's surgically... Um, uh, uh, surgical procedure that has some efficacy. I talked about that's, that's really. I had a podcast on the the vagus nerve with um, uh, Kevin. Uh, what Tracy, Kevin Tracy, I think. Any anyway, when I when I learned about the vagus nerve, it was all that everything is going down. You, you've got the, it's the parasympathetic nervous system, and it's controlling your heart rate and your gut motility. And then, but it turns out most of the nerves in the vagus nerve are actually going up to the brain. Yeah, it's uh, the vagal afferents are important. Yeah. And, and then what about, so you're you're now head of this uh, psychedelic research uh, program down there in Austin. And what are you... Are you optimistic about this? Um, what's your thinking on the current status of that? So, so you know, I'm um, I'm agnostic because I'm all about data. Yeah. So you know, I don't. You know, you know the studies that you referred to earlier about you know exercise, um, about lifestyle, um, all of those things. As long as they're evidence based, I absolutely support them. Mm. Nutrition. Um, a lot of the, before I tell you about psychedelics, a lot of the um, alternative treatments for depression, like um, omega-3 fatty acids, hmm. uh, S-adenosyl methionine, uh, folate, all these sort of nutraceutical approaches have not borne very much fruit. So St. John's people, wort. Yeah, St. John's wort, definitely not. So, um the truth is, is that only a third of patients treated with either psychotherapy or pharmacotherapy alone get into remission, which mm -hmm. means there's a huge unmet need for people with depression. So there are a lot of things that you could do. A lot of it is evidence-based. You could use medications to augment the effects of antidepressants, like aripiprazole, uh, as an example, um, you can combine two antidepressants. You can um, combine psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy. You could add exercise. You can do all of these things, but there there is a um, a group of patients that are um, clearly treatment resistant. You know, when I've done everything I can, um, including TMS um, and maybe even ECT, um, they're treatment resistant. They're just not better and they're miserable yeah. and every day is hell and they think about suicide. And so 
the idea came up that psychedelics um, were a treatment that could um, get people out of what I call the circle of hell. So if you're depressed and you're sitting there and, and day after day you're thinking, I'm a burden on my family, I'm a bad pay person, God is punishing me, um, I'm hopeless about ever feeling better, I'm helpless to do anything about it, the only respite I have is when I'm sleeping, I'm unable to experience any pleasure at all. Um, I call that the circle of hell. Yeah. And there are certain conditions in psychiatry that are characterized by intrusive ruminating thought patterns. Mm -hmm. Obsessive compulsive disorder is like that. Anorexia nervosa is like that. Addictions are like that. And so one of the questions is, can psychedelics get you out of that literal neurocircuit of hell? Yeah. And, um, and, and that's an appealing hypothesis. And so, you know, I'm, I'm editing a special issue of the American Journal of Psychiatry on psychedelics. And so I've had a chance to see, you know, the latest findings and the research that we've done. And I would summarize it by saying there are a lot of unanswered questions. One. Two, the psychedelic experience is not for the faint-hearted. It's tough. Huh. Because what psychedelics do is they rip your defenses away. And normally, you know, you and I are, you know, we're, we're hanging out in our own lives. And we're not thinking about, you know, hey, we may only have 10 or 15 years left. Right. <laughs> right. We don't think about that because it's uncomfortable. Yeah. And we don't think about our concerns about our children and grandchildren or politics. We're sort of trying to defend against bad thoughts. When you take psychedelics, you know, um, all of those defenses are ripped away. And so your view of yourself and the rest of the world and your relationship to it, it sort of blows up. And so um that's why some people have bad experiences yeah but having said that you know there is data that that psilocybin in a psychedelic dose um, does have some benefit for depressed people who have not responded to other treatments yeah now the last paper in the new england journal of medicine it was statistically significant uh it was clinically significant for some of the patients. And the effects seem to be somewhat prolonged, right? Yeah. Um, the unanswered questions are, one, what are they good for besides depression if they are? And it looks like maybe alcohol abuse, um, which would be a big deal. Yeah. And the MDMA data on PTSD is very impressive. Absolutely. Um, but um, some of the unanswered questions are, well, what about microdosing? Wouldn't it be better to take a sub-psychedelic dose every day hmm. instead of taking a psychedelic dose once every six weeks? Hmm. So I think we need more data. Sure. Yeah. Um, but the, the other concern is um, the companies that are conducting these trials which are very expensive, are going to translate into this being a very expensive treatment. So, you know, the question yeah. is, Mark, let's say you were a patient with treatment refractory depression. You had a choice. Let's say the FDA approves the drug and the cost is $15,000 for a single treatment. Well, and, and if your insurance company won't pay for it, and I have doubts that they will, so you're going to fly to Portland where psilocybin has been made legal. You're going to go to the mushroom store mm -hmm. where the, the dude behind the counter is going to say, oh, you look like you need about a three gram dose. And he's going to cut off a chunk of mushroom and of course, you and I both know that the the concentration 
of psilocybin will vary sure. from batch to batch. Yeah. And then you're going to take your little bag with your mushrooms to the therapist who's been certified by online training with no professional degree. You're not going to get medically screened by anybody. And then you'll pay the therapist a thousand dollars to sit with you for eight hours while you have your psychedelic experience. Yeah. I I don't see that being a reasonable um medical structure. No, so there there's a lot of uh, these startup companies focused on psychedelics and the kind of their angle is to just which I think is the history of the uh, um psychopharmacology actually is uh so you've got psilocybin, right? And there's clinical trials say it has statistically significant effect, um, but they're making they're modifying the molecule, right? It may not be any better than psilocybin. So then, as far as cost, what about LSD? It's very inexpensive. It's yeah. So there's a it, company called Mind Med that um, has just gotten FDA approval to fast track, but micro doses of LSD. I see. For the treatment of generalized anxiety disorder, apparently they have some um, positive early uh, pilot data. So I'm much more attracted to the microdosing approach. Uh huh. Not different than taking Prozac every day. No, right? and then and then also, you know, if it's effective in microdosing, uh, with the doses that cause a psychedelic experience. Uh, some percentage it's not high it can cause frank psychosis yeah right? so you know one of the questions about the deregulation in oregon and now california is if you had a loaded family history of bipolar disorder or schizophrenia you think it's a good idea for you to take psychedelics i don't think so no Okay, Charlie, I know you've got uh, something else coming up there now. You're, you know, I'm re semi-retired now. You're still working 24-7. Well, you're, you're, you're more mentally healthy than I am. I don't know about that. I can't. <laughs> this is the only thing I know how to do. But I did have time to write a couple books after re retiring. And I, I'm doing this so I can just keep up on neuroscience and also provide a resource for particularly for undergraduates, graduate students in neuroscience who, who, who want to see what, you know, people like you, top people are doing. That's great. That's great. My hat's off to you. Okay. Well, I've been, I spent two years in Texas and uh, Denton got a master's degree and I met my wife there. She's from Waxahachie. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, Texas is quite a place. Yeah, it is. It's a very interesting place. It's a big place. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, good to see you, Mark, and I hope I see you again soon. Okay, likewise, Charlie. All right, Bye. see ya. Bye.